My name is Wayne Place. I'm a professor of architecture. I have a PhD in physics and a master's degree in architecture. And I'm a registered structural engineer in the states of North Carolina and California. Today I want to talk about structural design as a part of the overall process of architectural design. Uh, more specifically, I'm going to talk about what you're going to experience in ARC 331 and 332, which are our two primary courses in structural design. And in those courses, we will focus primarily on what I sometimes call meat and potatoes structures. And by that, I mean thinking through a typical structural system for a typical building, which means working out uh, an efficient column grid, providing elements for resisting gravity, horizontal forces of wind and seismic, and also wind uplift. It means accounting for various load combinations to provide proper safety factors. It also means applying guidelines for spans and proportions of beams and common truss configurations in various materials. And it also involves designing connections between the various structural elements, sizing structural elements, and verifying the simplified guidelines for spans and proportions with more in-depth analysis. So as a visual example, this is a building which contains uh, steel beams supporting the roof, steel beams supporting the floor, steel trusses, steel columns, and corrugated steel decking. We're going to learn where all those elements are most appropriately used, how they're connected together, and we're also going to size them so we understand what's involved in the structural design process. We're also going to look at um, the elements that need to be added to provide lateral stability to the building. So, for example, these compression struts here and here and there and there and over here are provided to resist wind load and seismic effects in this building. While we're going to deal predominantly with this meat and potatoes approach to structures, we're also going to examine some more structurally expressive configurations such as bow trusses, arches, barrel vaults, cross vaults, hyperbolic paraboloid vaults, domes, toroidal compression structures, suspension structures, hyperbolic paraboloid cable networks, and toroidal cable networks. But before we can delve into all of those things, we need to go to some really fundamental thought processes and define the various types of structural action. So one of the things we can do is we can take a long member and subject it to tension along its length. In other words, we can attach things to each end and pull on the member. And in the process, we create what we call axial tension, meaning that the tension is along the centroid of the long direction of the member. We can also compress the member by putting forces that are uh, along the long length of the member. In the case of tension, the member fails by the material yielding or tearing apart. In the case of compression, the structure may fail by crushing of the material, or it may fail by lateral instability, which we call buckling. So lateral instability uh, occurs when a member is not stiff enough to stay under the load and it begins to move to the side to get out from under the load. We'll come back to that point uh, on multiple occasions. So axial tension and axial compression involve members or forces parallel to the long direction of the member. Bending involves forces perpendicular to the long direction of the member and finally, torsion involves anything that tends to twist the member. So here we have uh, demonstrations of axial tension, axial compression, and bending, which were the first 
three of these types of structural action that we were talking about. Uh, in this case, we're dealing in every instance with a six inch long piece of PVC welding rod, which is one eighth of an inch in diameter. In this case, the welding rod has been uh, embedded in this wooden block and this wooden block. This block was screwed to the wall of my office and then weights were hung off of that to create a tensile force in that rod. Now that rod probably would have held a hundred or a couple hundred pounds. I only put 20 pounds on it to demonstrate what the effect was and to demonstrate that working in tension, it works really well. The second type of structural action we mentioned was axial compression. In this case, that rod has been compressed between a wooden plate on the top and a wooden plate on the bottom. Uh, the wooden plate on the top is supported at its center by a hinge, and as a consequence, that plate is perfectly balanced and adds no load by itself to this little column. This little column was originally straight, and we began to add load to it, and at some point we added just the right amount of load that we induced what we call elastic instability. And what we mean by that is the structure started to collapse. And by the way, it would have collapsed completely, but I had the foresight to take this two by four block and insert it there so that the structure that's causing this damage to the column would be inhibited from moving too far. I didn't want to crush the column. I wanted to freeze the failure mode uh, part way down so that we could see the shape of the column. Uh, in this case, it turns out it's half of a sine curve. And um, we call it elastic instability because long before we've reached the point where the material is yielding, it begins to change shape. This elastic instability um, can be demonstrated to be elastic because in the case of this test right here, once I removed those weights which were causing the failure, the column snapped back to its original straight form. In other words, we did not yield the material plastically, we did not deform the material, but the structure failed nonetheless due to this elastic instability. Elastic instability is often referred to by the simplified term of buckling. Buckling is a catastrophic failure. If I didn't have that wooden block there, the structure would have continued on down until the plastic was uh, deformed and permanently mangled. But what initiated it was buckling. In other words, the material was still elastic when this catastrophic change in shape began to occur. Now at the bottom here we see buckling. So in this case we had tension that was stretching the material. Here we had compression that was tending to crush the material. In this case though the longitudinal direction of the member or the long direction was running horizontal and we began, began to hang weights on it and they created a force perpendicular to the direction of the member. This is our working definition of a bending phenomenon and this member has to exhibit a bending action in order to sustain the weight. Now there's a crucial issue here. We call this buckling, we call this bending. They're both seven letter words that start with B and end in ING and for many of our students, words that are that similar become indispensable and they interchange the words buckling and bending. Uh, they are absolutely not interchangeable though. Buckling is a catastrophic failure which is not self-limiting and which happens in the blink of an eye and in involves the collapse of your structure. Bending, on the other hand, is a very natural phenomenon which occurs gradually and is a fundamental part of the structural action of things such as beams or decking, which are crucial parts of buildings that we design.
The third, oh, excuse me, fourth type of structural action is torsion. In this case, we've created pure torsion in the following way. Here we have a piece of styrene plastic that has been cut and glued into a square tube. That square tube is connected at this other end in a way where it cannot rotate there. At this end, it has a screw sticking out, and that screw sticks into a little um, uh, notch in this plastic support. So this element is free to rotate about that point, but the screw is supporting this end of this tubular beam. The other end is supported by its gluing to this piece of plastic. You'll notice here we've added a fairly substantial off-center force, which is causing a tendency for this tube to twist. What's interesting is, even though we have a substantial amount of eccentric load there, there's no apparent twisting of that square tube. If we took the same four layers of material and glued them into the solid bar, which is four times as thick as one of these walls, but the same width in the other direction. When we do that, we begin to see some significant twisting in this member. And in fact, the member cross-section is vertical at the far end where it's attached. But at this end, you'll notice that the element that's inducing this twisting has rotated downward substantially. It not only has rotated down in a very visible way, but the weight that's inducing that effect is much smaller than the weight up here. If we want to see something that works even worse from a torsional point of view, we can take that same amount of material and create an I-beam with a flange on the bottom, a flange on the top, and a web. And now when we apply this eccentric force, we get a massive amount of twisting. And that happens with this very small amount of weight. So this weight is much less than that, which is much, much less than that. So what we conclude from this is that a tube is very strong and very stiff and resisting torsion. A flat bar, less so, and an I-beam is the worst possible shape uh, for resisting torsion. So if you're designing a structure and you want an element to provide torsional strength and torsional stiffness, an I-section is the last thing that you want. Okay, so those are the four types of structural action. Axial tension, axial compression, bending, and torsion. Now, one of the things that many of us are interested in is structural expressionism where instead of sort of burying the structure and making it disappear or not making it visually prominent, um, we want to make it expressive. And we say an expressive structure uses members that are shaped in a way that expresses their structural function. When we look at them, we know exactly the nature of their structural action. For example, a rope or a steel cable or a slender steel rod can only resist tension. They buckle immediately under even a minor compressive force and deform radically under any bending influence. So this is a structure of that nature. If we have a wind load that's coming in parallel to this member, so that wind load is exhibiting, exerting a force on the wall, which we can't see, but it's over to the right here in terms of this photograph. That wall is going to bear against this member, and this member is going into compression. And that member is uh, formed in a way that we expect for something that's in compression. We want it to be have some breadth in both directions because we don't want it weak or tending to buckle in either direction. So its cross-section is fairly symmetric. That compression member is delivering a force right here, which is then inducing tension in this member, which is a slender steel rod, and compression in this vertical member.
you can't look at the slender rod and believe that it could ever be a compression member or a bending member. It's a pure tension member and it expresses its behavior accordingly. This member is a pure compression member and exhibits its behavior accordingly. This member, on the other hand, is very deep in one direction and fairly thin in the other, and it's e exhibiting uh, a bending quality and an ability to resist forces in bending. Um, it's kind of interesting that this bending member is much, much deeper, uh, much sturdier than the others, and that has to do with the fact that in tension, the, ma the material works really well. In compression, it works pretty well, and in bending, it's much, much less efficient. So this structure expresses what these members have to do in order to act in the manner in which they were intended to act. Okay, so we're going to talk uh, uh, initially ab about some structures that are predominantly tension structures. Um, and we have very few examples of pure tension structures. The only two that really come to my mind are something like a space station or a basketball or soccer ball. Uh, a space station floats out in space. It has essentially no forces on it. It has a fairly substantial force of the air and oxygen internal to it. So it wants to function in a tensile mode and it wants to take on the most appropriate shape to that, which is either a sphere or a cylinder. A basketball or a soccer ball is a similar situation when it's flying through the air in that the primary force on it is the compressed air inside the ball. When the ball hits something, it may have induced in it other kinds of stresses, but it's pure axial tension when the basketball is just flying through the air. Um, these are fairly exotic and non-architectural examples. In architectural applications on the earth, tension members require compression or bending elements to allow them to perform their tension functions. In other words, we don't have pure tension structures uh, in applications in buildings on the earth. So here is an example of a, what we would call a predominantly tensile structure or a structure at least in which tension is a primary uh, structural mode of action. This is Saarinen's Dulles Airport. This roof is supported uh, by a tension in steel cables in the roof. This photograph shows those very, very delicate steel str uh, strands which are supporting this roof. This literally is what's supporting this roof. Those things barely show up in the photograph. They're made out of steel, which is capable of uh, enduring 270 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 270,000 pounds, per square inch before it yields and fails. So we have super delicate cables that are supporting this roof. To keep that roof from pulling inward and causing these elements to keel over towards the center, that one and this one, in order to keep that from happening, these members are cantilevering out of the structure below which means they're really thick at the base. They have a lot of tension on this side and a lot of compression on that side. So these members are bending members that allow this tension roof to actually function in tension and still stand up under gravity. Now a structure like that works really well for gravity. Um, those cables though, if you attach something really lightweight to them in the form of a roof, uh, they will be sucked upwards and the structure will begin to kite, which is a process in which there is violent movement under wind suction and enormous stress concentrations in the structural elements. 
In order to avoid that in the Dulles Airport, uh, dead weight was added. So you'll notice here there are concrete planks which span from cable line to cable line. That keeps the roof from kiting. The roof might still sort of slosh back and forth, and to prevent that from happening, another layer of, layer of concrete was put on top of this. And that concrete went down between these um, planks of concrete to create ribs, and the stiffness of those ribs are what keeps this roof from sort of undulating back and forth. The dead weight keeps it from just flying away, but it can still deform fairly substantially if we don't provide some stiffness. So this roof is primarily supported under gravity loads by the cables in it, but to keep it from deforming under variable loads such as wind, um, there's a thickness to it and a stiffness to it that represents beam-like action. Now, I think the Dulles Airport is an incredibly beautiful building. It has wonderful daylighting. I should go back and show you that. This is the side that's facing south. You'll notice it's lower with big overhangs. This is the side facing north. All the glazing is tilting outwards so it becomes self-shading uh, from a daylighting point of view and a spatial point of view. This is an incredibly beautiful building. There's something a bit philosophically disturbing to me, though, about using these super delicate cables and then super massive concrete to hold it up under wind loads. There is an alternative to that, and we have one here locally, which is Dorton Arena. Originally, it was called the, wild, the uh, Livestock Exhibition Pavilion a pretty mundane kind of building, which was designed by Matthew Nowitzki, who at the time was the head of architecture at the North Carolina College, or what was at that time School of Design. Matthew Nowitzki was a brilliant person. He managed to design a building that was 300 foot span in this direction, 300 foot span in that direction. It was super lightweight, very economical, and had no columns on the interior. And the way it worked was these arches, which are in the shape of parabolas, work in compression. They are supported by these vertical columns. Then steel cables were draped in between the arches, and those were draped in a way to resist gravity forces, such as snow. And then other cables were thrown over the top of that and clamped down to them. And I often refer to these cables, the first ones I showed, as the gravity cables. And the cables over the top I call the wind cables because that specifies what the, the uh, applied forces were that each of those elements were supposed to resist. So we're holding this building down with more lightweight cables as opposed to uh, with enormous amounts of concrete. And the roof on this building is actually quite lightweight, and without these wind cables, it would fly away violently. This is a top view of the structure. This is a view on the roof. And by the way, I've shown a video here that was put together on Dorton Arena by uh, UNC TV. And you might want to go look at that to see some of the history of this building. This building is actually quite spectacular. It was the first of its kind. Uh, it inspired Fry Otto to do his amazing work, including the stadium in Munich in 1972. Uh, there are universities in the, in the world that teach an entire structures course just on Dorton Arena. Um, and we have people who come to the city of Raleigh exclusively for the purpose of visiting this building. That person that you saw in the last photograph has walked over to the other side, so she's roughly a football field away, and this gives you a sense of the uh, extent of the expanse of that roof.
This is a view from ground level and a view from the interior. This building, uh, as I mentioned, was originally designed as a livestock exhibition pavilion, but it was used almost constantly for 50 years um, for things like professional hockey, professional basketball, uh, college track mates, tractor pulls, animal exhibitions, the, the, um, the circus came here and attached all their trapeze things to the cables in the roof and they brought their um, animals uh, such as the elephants and horses and so forth which came from just across the tracks into the space and it was a really beautiful wonderfully daylit space for all kinds of activities um, the cables in the roof have to be counter tensioned so that under the worst wind suction the gravity cables don't go slack because if we allow that to happen you can begin to get flutter and vibration in the roof that you don't want so to counter tension those cables every single cable has got some kind of an adjustment which can control the tension in the building to my knowledge these have never been adjusted since the building was built and it's been in existence for close to 70 years um, with no fundamental changes in the structure again this is a reference to the video on unc tv now the idea of a network of counter tension cables does not apply just to roofs which have to resist gravity loads such as snow and wind suction upwards um, we can also put it on walls so this is the cable supported glass wall at the seattle tacoma international airport which was designed by Fentress Architects, and Kirk Fentress is perhaps the most distinguished graduate of our college. Uh, he's done airports all around the world, uh, including RDU Terminal 2. So, in this case, we have cables that are curved in this direction to resist inward forces of wind and then cables curved in this direction to resist outward suction of wind. Um, these cables are sustained. These cables have enormous forces in them, and they, in order to act, are inducing huge amounts of compression in these columns, and also a substantial amount of bending in the cantilever that comes out to support the tops of these cables. This is the Golden Gate Suspension Bridge. Um, in order to maintain the tension in these cables, the cables run continuously up over the towers, back down, up again, and back down again. And actually, the wire is run for many, many miles, back and forth, back and forth, with no splices in it. But the loops at the end are attached to steel bars, which are then embedded in a gigantic chunk of concrete. And that gigantic chunk of concrete is buried in a rock mountain. So what makes a suspension bridge like this feasible is the existence of something that it can claw into. Um, these cables are roughly uh, a meter in diameter, about 39 inches. Uh, the material can tolerate, even with a safety factor, 170,000 pounds per square inch. So the force that's being delivered to those anchorages is enormous. So there are many massive, huge parts of this that don't show up. And so people look at these delicate cables and they're in awe that such delicate things can support so much load. And they can, but they can't support it without other structural elements that help them work. So in the case of Dorton Arena, what works for the cables are the arches. In the case of this bridge, what's sustaining it are the anchorages.
You've all been to a child's uh, playground where they have suspension structures. You've walked across a suspension bridge. You've gotten the thrill of noticing that it changes shape constantly as you move around. This is a manifestation of the fundamental nature of the chain or whatever tension element it is that's supporting that bridge. It changes shape constantly when the force pattern on it changes. That gives little children a thrill. Sometimes even some of us who are adults love that feeling of exhilaration. It's not what you want on a bridge, though, where vehicles that are undulating up and down uh, might lose control. So we deal with that undulation or variable force by providing this truss along the side of the bridge. This truss is, by all of our normal standards, huge. It's about 30 feet deep and made out of very powerful structural elements. On the other hand, on the scale of this bridge, it seems rather delicate. But the concept of the bridge is the uniform loads, either from the roadbed or from uniform traffic, is handled by these cable elements. And then any non-uniform force, um, such as a, a convoy of trucks that stops right here, for example, for an accident, um, those non-uniform forces get absorbed by the truss on the side of the bridge. We can take these concepts for the fabulous engineering marvels like the Golden Gate Bridge, and we can apply them in buildings. So here we have a bridge with two towers that are supporting this cable structure. Now there's no cable on the other side to counter this cable. So we need something to hold these towers apart so they don't get pulled together by the suspension element. And that something or other that's holding the towers apart is this truss, or actually two trusses, that create this tubular structure which holds the towers apart. Uh, those trusses also serve the function that if we have shifting load, uh, they take care of that so that the shape of the structure doesn't change and we don't end up with glass either falling out or being crushed. Uh, you'll notice this truss in proportion to everything else is much deeper than the truss was in the case of the Golden Gate Bridge because here we only had to keep it stiff enough for vehicles to hold on to the road. In this case, we have to make the structure stiff enough that the glass, which is very brittle and very unforgiving, doesn't shatter and fall out. This is that building during construction. Um, this is roughly a 300 foot span, which is the length of a football field or a fairly common city block. And then in the other direction, it's about 65 or 70 feet, which means every one of these floors is absolutely column free. At the boundary, we have column elements above the tension structure, and then we have suspenders for the floors below the tension structure. And so the elements above are expressed as columns, and these elements below the suspension element are expressed as tension members. And in this case, they made them um, one inch by eight inch plates so that when you look at them edge on, uh, they're almost invisible. This is a view of the external part of the structure. Here they moved the glass to the front down below the suspension element. So it appears to be incredibly delicate. And then they moved the glass back and encase the columns in insulation and cladding uh, to emphasize the compression nature of those things. So this is a very efficient, very effective structure, which is carrying 10 stories of massive loads of concrete floor and, and human loads. All those loads are being handled very efficiently by this structure. And in the process, it's telling you a huge amount about what the parts and pieces are doing. So this is what that looks like um, when we look at it from off axis. So that completes part one of this presentation. Uh, we're now going to move on to part two.